It's important to choose an amplifier well suited to power your speakers. For one, this will ensure that your system provides the best sound quality possible, but it will also help to protect your equipment. If you choose the wrong amplifier, you run the risk of causing damage to your speakers or to the amplifier itself. In this video, you'll learn what to consider when choosing an amplifier to power your speakers or your subwoofers. Before we get started, while I will focus on choosing an amplifier in this video, I really recommend choosing your speakers first when designing a system. So to see the full system design process that I recommend, check out the link in the description below this video. There are two basic factors to keep in mind when choosing an amp that is compatible with your speakers, impedance and power. And as you'll see, these two factors are very closely interrelated. Impedance is measured in ohms and refers to the opposition a circuit presents to electric current. The first step in choosing an amplifier is to determine the nominal impedance of your speaker or speakers. You can find the nominal impedance of your speaker in the technical specifications on the manufacturer's website, and the nominal impedance of a speaker is most often 4, 8, or 16 ohms. If you're connecting multiple speakers to a single amplifier channel, finding the total impedance can be a bit more complicated, so check out the post I made on calculating speaker impedance using the link below the video. Power is measured in watts and refers to the rate that energy is transferred. The power handling rating of your speaker can also be found in the technical specifications. You'll probably find various power ratings in your speaker's technical specs. Peak power, continuous power, etc. Peak power refers to the maximum power a speaker can handle without damage, and this specification can often be misleading. We're more concerned with how much power the speaker can handle over an extended period of time. This is the continuous power rating of the speaker. Depending on the manufacturer, RMS or AES specifications might be given instead of a continuous power rating, but be sure to note how the power rating was measured if you can, as this will tell you if the rating was measured using a particular test tone frequency, like one kilohertz, using pink noise, or using music. Now that you know the nominal impedance and continuous power handling capacity of your speaker, it's time to choose an amplifier. Let's say I'm trying to find an amplifier to power two QSC E115 speakers, and we'll assume that we'll only have one E115 speaker on each amplifier channel. I'll make sure that the amplifier is rated to operate at the speaker's nominal impedance, which is eight ohms. If the impedance of the speaker is lower than the amplifier is rated for, it will probably cause the amplifier to overheat. But if the impedance of the speaker is greater than the amplifier is rated for, the sound quality and performance of the system will be negatively affected. The next step is to make sure the amplifier is capable of supplying enough power to the speaker. The continuous power rating of the E115 is 500 watts, but like I said, impedance and power are interrelated. You can see this by looking at amplifier specifications, such as those for the QSC GXD amps. At 4 ohms, this amplifier is capable of supplying 800 watts of continuous power. However, at 8 ohms, the amplifier is capable of supplying only 400 watts. Choosing an amp that supplies too much power makes it possible to exceed the limits of the speaker. This is true. Of course, when the speaker begins to distort, you'd hopefully hear that distortion and turn it down to avoid damage. On the other hand, choosing an amp that supplies too little power or just enough power won't utilize the full potential of the speaker and using an underpowered amplifier might actually increase the likelihood of damage. I know this sounds counterintuitive, but hear me out. With an underpowered amp, you might have the tendency to add more and more gain to the signal to get a louder output, even though you've already reached the limitations of the amplifier. At a certain point, the signal will start clipping, meaning it won't get any louder. It will just cause distortion of the signal, which can stress the speakers to the point of overheating. In fact, it's much easier to damage speakers using an underpowered amplifier than it is using an overpowered amplifier within reason. The truth is, there really isn't a simple rule for matching amplifiers to speakers. No matter which amplifier and speaker combination you're using, there is always the possibility that incorrect gain structure will cause damage. My recommendation is to choose an amplifier that's capable of providing about twice the continuous power rating of the speaker you're connecting, assuming you practice proper gain structure. Remember, a doubling of power is only a three decibel change. 
So choosing an amplifier that's capable of providing double the continuous power handling capacity of the speaker will allow the amplifier to provide adequate power to the speaker while maintaining some extra headroom to avoid the tendency to overdrive the input of the amplifier. As a best practice, you can place a limiter before the input of the amplifier to prevent sending too much power to the speaker, but this isn't a foolproof solution because excessive limiting can also create excessive distortion. The best way to prevent damage and to get the best possible sound quality is to use speakers that are designed to provide adequate sound pressure level for the application at hand. That way you won't feel the need to try to turn them up beyond their limitations. For help choosing the right speakers, download the free speaker specs guide at audiouniversityonline.com slash speaker specs guide. Knowing what we know now, let's step this amplifier up a model to give us some headroom. Instead of the QSC GXD4 amp, which supplies 400 watts per channel at eight ohms, let's look at the GXD8, which supplies 800 watts at eight ohms. This is a better fit as it gives us some headroom to comfortably supply enough power to get the most out of these speakers. Now this doesn't quite reach the recommendation for an amp with twice the continuous power rating of the speaker, but it does give us some headroom. If we intend to run these speakers at their full 500 watt continuous power capacity, we might want an even more powerful amplifier. But at that point, we may even consider more powerful speakers so we don't have to run them at their fullest potential. This topic goes much, much deeper than I've explored in this video. And that's because there are so many variables at play. Hopefully you've learned some principles in this video that will allow you to explore some of the other variables on your own, such as frequency range, damping factor, dynamic range, and so on. In the next video that's on your screen now, we're looking at a basic system design process that will help you choose speakers for the situation at hand. I'll see you there.